So we now aim at reviewing a public archaeology theoretical study case. First of all, what is public archaeology? Gabriel Moshenska defined it as the practice and scholarship where archaeology meets the world. In the second half of the 20th century, it becomes clear that heritage management should include education and participation. So thanks to this impulse, from the 1970s onwards, public archaeology started to develop in the United States and UK and then spread internationally. However, this field of study still needs to be further diffused throughout many countries of the world. Public archaeology is the act of presenting archaeological data and results to the public, attempting to meet its interest. Public archaeology aims at studying how archaeology and society can communicate one with the other in order to enhance and give more value to this relationship. The idea behind it is the cultural communication should be addressed to a wide audience. Public archaeology points at creating a more and more democratic public sphere. Indeed, when acting on behalf of the public, the public itself should have the right of directly participating with the archaeological heritage. According to some of the most recent studies in this field, public archaeology is a system of communication working at different levels of society. There is a large variety of strategies and techniques that archaeologists, museum and historical societies can use to present data and results to the public. For example, books and public lectures, television programs, YouTube channels, social networks, but also archaeological excavations open to the public and events of living history. In this field of study, what does public mean? Perhaps the best way to answer to this question is to show a graphic on some common types of public archaeology, which presents some different kinds of relationship between archaeology and the public. We can distinguish seven categories. So the first one, archaeologists working with the public. This is the so-called community archaeology, including projects run by museums, universities or commercial units. In this case, the public can experience what the archaeological work is as well as acquiring more awareness on the heritage of our area. The second is archaeology by the public, also called amateur archaeology. This goes with some severe limitations. The third one, public sector archaeology, includes all the state-controlled or state-funded bodies which preserve, manage and communicate the heritage. Four, archaeological education. The settings are museums or archaeological sites where visitors can interact with staff. These types of projects generally include guided tours, field schools and so on. Number five, open archaeology fosters openness and sharing of archaeological practices and processes, both at a scientific and at a more popular level. Six, popular archaeology, possibly also called media archaeology, it involves the use of social media in order to make more accessible and comprehensible the scientific contents to the public. And finally, number seven, academic public archaeology, which means the study of archaeology itself by researchers and experts under different points of view, economical, political, social, and so on. The sharing and understanding of cultural heritage by the public are fundamental to guarantee safeguard and preservation. The reason is simple. If people are prepared to recognize value for the cultural heritage, they will be more inclined to protect it. With this in mind, public archaeology and museums are strictly connected. Thanks to museums, people are aware of the value of the collections and the importance of the research carried out in museum institutions. At the same time, a wide audience can access scientific results and understand them through the tools provided by museums. A good example of interaction between the public and the archaeological world is the Portable Antiquity Scheme. This is a voluntary program started in 1997 and run by the UK government. The aim is to record the numerous archaeological small finds recovered by people. The Portable Antiquity Scheme provides funding for finds liaison officers at local museums, where they examine the objects and add more information. In this way, objects which would otherwise go unrecorded are listed and described and that can, for example, help archaeologists to address their field research in areas not yet investigated. An example of public archaeology in the field of museums is Micropasts, a platform for archaeology crowdsourcing. Born in 2013 at the University College London, Micropasts is useful for cultural heritage operators for managing collections and carrying out scientific researches with the support of the public. In this context, the Egyptian Museum in Turin in Italy started a collaboration with UCL for introducing some new methods of public participation. In particular, the aim of the collaboration is to use micropaths in order to realize 3D models of objects from the Egyptian Museum for both scientific and educational purposes. To conclude, as all the young disciplines, public archaeology has some collateral effects and negative aspects not yet completely codified in all their aspects, as the looting and trade of antiquities, but this topic will be touched in detail in week 3.